I think experts are terrible sources of evidence. I think experts are great for helping us understand things, to explain things, to help us understand the evidence. Yeah. But in the end, I think it's the evidence that's much more important than what experts the Evidence tell you is more about. important than the expert. That is think, Absolutely. Good. And there's all kinds of examples where people have made all kinds of mistakes. In other words, you get the problem that the expert is held up as being the font of wisdom. They are not. Or they are up to a point. They are about some things, but not necessarily about evidence. Again, it's very much overlapping with eminence. So often, often experts are eminent, and if you, you know, there's all kinds of problems with people being eminent as well, that we tend to, you know, to have overconfidence in what they're telling us or what they're saying. Welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better, where we explore how you can apply insights from visionary leaders and the most provocative philosophers and scientists of our time to make your life and our world a better place. Here's your host, author and speaker, Paul Gibbons. Hey, welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better. I've got great news. The podcast is soaring from hundreds of downloads to now thousands. Uh, the biggest podcasts in the world get tens of thousands of listeners, and we'd certainly love to get there. If you like it, please share it. I'm thrilled personally. You know, when you start any new venture such as this, invest all the time it takes to get it off the ground, you never know how it's going to go. And it's going as well as I could have possibly imagined. So thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Last week, we talked to Scott Lilienfeld about psychological myths. If you haven't listened, I found our conversation incredibly illuminating. I've got coming up scheduled Anne Hulbert, who's written a book on gifted children, and I'm planning an episode on depression and one on opioid addiction. I've got Jacques Attali, who had senior cabinet positions in the French government and was head of the European Bank for Reconstruction in Development. We're going to talk about Brexit and many issues of global concern, but from a European perspective, it should be very illuminating. I've got an invite out to Google's former head of human resources, Laszlo Bach, and I'm still waiting for confirmation from Steven Pinker so we can start our three-part series on enlightenment. From my point of view, there's very good news. We now have a way for you to support the podcast. From a buck an episode, maybe to as much as $25 an episode if you're rich or if you feel rich. See my Patreon site. You're going to have to type in www.patreon.com backslash Paul Gibbons, and I will invite you monthly to a free bull session with one of my famous guests. Please consider it. They should be a ton of fun. And if you've reviewed the podcast on iTunes, and if you haven't, why not? It takes about three seconds. Please tell me so I can send you one of our famous author's books for free. So, on to today. In management and society, we see quick fixes. We see failed change. We see money thrown away and things that don't work in government, but also extremely in the private sector where I've worked most of my life. We see a gap between what experts prescribe, what theory suggests, and what practitioners do. We see management hubris. We see people using their gut when it flies in the face of science. So, the counter to that could be something called evidence-based X, evidence-based something. And for X, you can substitute evidence-based management, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based education, evidence-based policy, evidence-based nursing, and multiple other things. It's a revolution, and I think it's a really necessary revolution for the 21st century. Let's start, though, at the very beginning. In this case, it's 1998 with medicine. Medicine looks very sciencey. It's based on the biology and physiology of the body. But until the 20th century, medicine was more like alchemy. You saw leeches, you saw all sorts of treatments that had been used historically that uh, had no effect and perhaps harmful effects. Medicine was a craft, much in the same way as we talk about leadership today being an art or a craft. And it took a long time for doctors to catch up with the revolution that took place in the biological sciences in the 19th century. But all the way up until 1998, doctors still replied, relied upon tradition, what they'd historically done, what medicine had traditionally done, what they learned from sales literature from drug companies or medical device companies, 
They relied on old knowledge, what they learned in med school, perhaps, which might be a long time ago. They relied on their beliefs, and they relied on their habits, and they relied on their gut. So this isn't satisfactory, particularly for something that ought to be grounded in the biology and physiology of the body. So around about the turn of the 21st century, there was an obvious, you would think it was obvious, but still a really revolutionary and radical idea. Doctors should combine the best evidence, say from clinical trials, with their expertise when they were treating patients. You could call that a flash of the blinding obvious. Slowly, the evidence-based medicine revolution percolated into education. Are smaller class sizes really better? Penal policy. Do longer sentences help prevent crime? By using evidence, we can answer big, big questions. Does paying teachers more improve school outcomes? Or are you throwing money away? Do charter schools work? Or are you throwing money away and exacerbating inequality? What encourages more efficient environmental behaviors? Do unemployment benefits decrease the motivation to work, as many would have us believe? We're going to talk specifically about management, but I want you to be aware that this is something that has broad, broad, and deep implications for how we govern ourselves as a society and for your practice in whatever you do, whether you're a government uh, leader or whether you're a politician or even in some of your decisions as a consumer, you want to think about some of the things we're talking about. But we're going to talk about evidence-based management. Unlike other professions, in fact, you could say management isn't a profession, there are no established legal or cultural requirements regarding education or specific knowledge that you need to become a manager. Anybody can become a manager. Business schools also don't teach evidence-based approaches to decision-making. And in many areas, especially in leadership, the evidence is insanely bad. One saying I like is that leadership theory consists largely of people making lists of things. Managers and leaders are therefore of highly variable quality. Test that hypothesis against your own experience. I would say, thank God, we don't have doctors wandering around that are of as variable quality as some of the managers and leaders we see in business organizations. So today we have Rob Greener. He's a friend of mine, and he's one of the world's experts in evidence-based management. He's a professor of organizational psychology at Queen Mary at the University of London. He also is scientific director of the Center for Evidence-Based Management. His psychological research include several topics, including work and well-being, emotion, stress, engagement, ethnicity, the psychological contract, absence from work, motivation to work, and everyday work behaviors. He is, in my opinion, a very special thinker. And in 2016, he was given a huge award as the most influential HR thinker in the world. So Rob and I are going to talk about what is evidence, what is an evidence-based approach, and how does it differ from other approaches? What are some of the criticisms of evidence-based management? How is evidence-based management different from other things like evidence-based medicine or other evidence-based policy? What is the importance when considering evidence of also considering stakeholders and management craft-like experience, their gut feel, if you will? What is the role of expertise in decision-making, including decision-making in democracies? Look, I'm very passionate about this subject. I've got half a chapter in my book, The Science of Organizational Change, on it. And in fact, it's a pretty good 12 pages. If you're only going to ever read 12 pages on it, it might not be a bad place to start. Uh, it's one of the back chapters of the book. I probably wish it was up at the beginning. I'm very passionate about it. And I learned a ton. And I was also disabused of some notions I had about evidence-based management that were perhaps too scientific. We'll get into that when we get into the show. Rob is a very, very classy thinker. I work in business schools. And so without being you know, unduly harsh to my colleagues at many of the schools in which I work, Breener is one of the great management thinkers of our time. And he fully earned, I think, that most influential HR thinker. His thinking is head and shoulders more nuanced, more practical. He is more deeply read and more intelligent than you know many of the people I've had a chance to interact with in the management consulting world, with which I spent, I think we're getting on for nearly 25 years. Unlike many academics who sometimes speak in language that's very far divorced from the concerns of practitioners, from the practices of practitioners, I think Rob really, for an academic, understands them in a very deep way, and he cares very much 
about the results that managers are able to achieve and how they achieve them. Our discussion of evidence-based management veers from the very basic to the very technical. But if you aren't a manager or a business person, let me ask you to listen for the deeper themes for decision-making and public policy and in democracies. Don't miss the bit 55 minutes in where we talk about expertise and democracy. And uh, the two quotes from Rob that I will, these are spoilers, trust the evidence, not the experts. And don't confuse eminence with expertise. So uh, you have that to look forward to. Uh, I'm really passionate about this subject and me, you know, maybe too overzealous about it. I've, I've written a bunch about it uh, in my book, The Science of Organizational Change. I should apologize. Uh, my passion uh, kind of got in my own way there. There's probably rather too much crosstalk. I probably uh, interrupt Rob a couple of more times. To, I owe him an apology for that. And I also cuss a little bit more than I normally do. So that's a trigger warning. If uh, F-bombs are going to send you running for the you know, the hills, you know, that uh, consider yourself uh, forewarned, if you will. There's a few dropped in discreetly here and there. And so now, without any more, let me welcome Rob Breener. Rob, welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better. Thank you very much. Yeah, good to talk to you again. Yes. So tell us before we start, something quirky and eccentric and unusual about you, you wouldn't see in the official uh, official bio on your okay. on the website. Well, of course, quirky and eccentric is always a relative thing, and it depends who you hang out with and what you believe. But I think a quite quirky thing about me, which isn't shared by many people, is I'm extremely interested in and sort of mildly obsessed about food and eating to the extent that I'll be th thinking about what to have for dinner several days, if not weeks in advance. So, yeah, that's a kind of quite a quirky thing in my day-to-day -day life. I'm very interested in what I'm going to eat, where I'm going to eat, where I'm going to get ingredients, how I'm going to cook it, and if I've got time, that kind of stuff. Is there is there clinical help for that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, possibly, but do I want help? Do I want help, or do I just want to kind of enjoy the indulgence? So, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, it sounds like a special dinner that you have will not just be, you know, quickly sit down in front of the television and snarf it down, but it's like a three-day anticipatory you exactly. know, <laughs> Yeah, and also one of the reasons why I could never probably live anywhere else apart from a big city like London where there's lots of interesting different places to eat, new places opening all the time, lots of different cuisines. So that's one of the reasons that I like living in London. Actually, that's funny. You know, it never occurred to me, but you know, you and I have had half a dozen or a dozen lunches over the years yeah. and you always pick the restaurant and you always like to use a cricket term, hit it for six. You actually always spot on when your restaurant choices. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't, that didn't occur to me about you, but there you are. One of the things I remember as quickly about you is that one time I walked into your office and you were listening to some really far out electronica i don't know if it was electronica or if it was hip hop or some alter really super out there music and the next time i popped into your office you're listening to wagner i thought oh this guy's a weirdo yeah <laughs> <laughs> is that still is that still you yeah I, like, I do like to mix things up in that way yes i go through phases of liking things and then also phases of kind of mixing things up sort of almost on you know within a day within an hour mixing stuff up so yes indeed it is i think it is all right then well uh, i think people have got enough of a sense of who we've got on the hook here good let's talk about evidence uh evidence-based x or do you want to start with evidence-based management so what is the what's all this hubbub about evidence-based that you can't avoid in management circles or policy circles right now well it's interesting to say you can't avoid it because i see a huge number of managers and other people completely avoiding it uh, <laughs> and in spite of some of the efforts we've made through the center for evidence-based management and lots of our members and fellows and so on it isn't it still isn't i would say that well known or that widespread the term evidence-based you're right it's certainly caught on if you look at what people are doing it doesn't really look like evidence-based to me what they mean is I've got some evidence, or I thought about some evidence, or we have some data, which is not really what evidence-based practice means. That's not a bad place to start, but yeah, I see what you mean. Like, I think you're probably right. Like, If I look contrast management practices today from 20 years ago, they're not radically transformed by any stretch of the imagination, are they? No, I don't think so. And I think, uh, although people are, so they, people are sort of thinking about it a bit more uh, as a means of doing practice in management, it, it's not well known yet. There we are working on it. Well, what is evidence-based uh, or, okay. or and what is not? Yeah, that's okay, right so there. I think this, and this is where, you know, whenever I'm talk, talking about this stuff, I always try and I always think it's really important to give a definition, partly for the reason I've said that people bandy around the term evidence-based. And normally they mean 
I got some information, and so I made a decision. Right. Evidence-based practice has a much more specific definition, and the one I'm going to give you is one we've developed to the Centre for Evidence-Based Management, but it certainly is not our definition. It's one that we picked up from many, many different areas, going from policing to medicine to social work to policy, making lots and lots of different fields, yep. of essentially adopting more or less the same definition. So the one we tend to use is that evidence-based yep. management is about the conscientious, which means you really try, explicit, which means you actually write it down, codify it, share it, and judicious, meaning you judge the quality, use of different sources of evidence, both to help you understand a sort of problem or opportunity, and also to think about a kind of solution or something you could do about that to exploit that opportunity in some way. And the fourth So diff- yeah. different sources of evidence. So I, yeah. suppose, I suppose the worm turns on evidence because there are people in common every day thing sure. a manager might say i've seen it with my own eyes you know i did x and, and y happened so th- that's my evidence right and in terms of evidence-based practice that would count as a source of evidence and this is one of the crucial points about it which is one of the many fundamental misunderstandings of it which is that actually it's different sources of evidence so the first source of evidence is the one you just mentioned which is your own professional expertise as a manager as an hr manager or as a practitioner of any kind so that's the first source now like any source of evidence, that professional expertise could be really valid, really reliable, really relevant, or it could be awful. And that's where the judicious bit comes in. So because a manager says, I've seen this in my own eyes, you go, well, fine. How many times have you seen it? How many contexts? How reliable is that observation? Is that sort of sample big enough to really rely on that and think of that as very trustworthy? So the key point is that it's not so much what the evidence is, but if it's relevant and trustworthy for that particular context and setting. So say the first source is your own expertise. So why wouldn't you use your expertise? After all, that's what we pay managers and practitioners and professionals to do. We don't want them to switch off every single memory they've got and all their bit of craft knowledge. We want them to incorporate it. So the first bit is that professional expertise. The second area, and this is in no particular order, again, in management, but it applies to different fields, is organizational data. So what do you actually know from the organization? What have you got? What's going on in it? So the equivalent, I guess, in a patient or a medical setting might be data from the patient themselves, from tests, from sure. MRI scans, other kinds of things. Or, or analytics in the management context, for exactly. example. Precisely. So yeah. what's going on with the organization? The third source is uh, scientific evidence, uh, and that would be particularly all scientific findings, typically from journal articles, peer-reviewed articles, other kind of sources. Uh, and again, is it, is it valid? Is it reliable? Is it relevant? And the fourth area is stakeholders. And it will be their concerns and their perspectives. So essentially, evidence-based management, evidence-based practice more generally is trying to look across those four sources, judge the quality and relevance of the evidence and apply it to both saying what is going on, what's the problem, and also what can we do about it. And I think some of the biggest misconceptions are focusing either just on one of those areas or saying one is better than another. And certainly for me, that is absolutely not what evidence-based practice is about. So when people say, all right, I saw, I saw this happen. I mean, so this brings us into the realm of cognitive biases. So availability biases, yeah. the narrative fallacy. So, I mean, I guess current, if I could say dogma or current thoughts are that human beings aren't as, we're great at recognizing patterns, but we overuse that sense-making pattern recognition apparatus to draw causal relationships where in fact none exist. And so yep. I think that's the difference between, I would want to make between someone's experience, which is a story they have about what they've done in the past and what works or what doesn't works and something that's more systematic. So, I mean, I suppose that's the important distinction as you get higher quality evidence. So maybe talk us through the hierarchy of evidence or what yeah. distinguishes it. Yeah. yeah. So go back to that point. I mean, you mentioned that the, the sort of biases, cognitive biases that a person might have in their own memory I would say those cognitive biases are potentially just as much of a problem in science. And as you know, things like the reproducibility crisis, things like the rewards in science, the problem we're getting with kind of people actually just, you know, making stuff up in science. I think all these are linked to partly to cognitive biases, but also partly to reward systems. So I think that uh, the, the idea of sort of people's cognitive biases affecting it does come out in all sorts of ways, even in sort of things you hope you could trust sort of like science. But the hierarchy of evidence, and this is, this is, again, is one of the major, I think, points of confusion in this field. The hierarchy of evidence actually comes from medicine, and it comes in particular from thinking about treatments. So if you're thinking about intervening to treat a particular condition or disease, 
then in fact, you'll think it's a very narrow kind of question. And for that narrow kind of question, it probably is the case that you can say, well, these kinds of designs are probably, scientific designs are probably better than these kinds. However, which evidence is better or more better, better quality depends entirely on the question you're asking. So certainly I, and at the Center for Evidence-Based Management, we try and get away from this idea of a hierarchy of evidence to say, uh-huh. yes, it's good to think about quality, but you need to always do it in the context you're in, not as a sort of abstract, God-given, this research is better than that research. That makes absolutely no sense, unless mm. you know what the question is. So I, th- so I think it's quite important for people to get an idea. There isn't necess- necessarily one kind of research, or even one kind of evidence that's better than another. It depends on the question. Well, let's run through the hierarchy. I mean, sure. well, okay. I mean, so, so not everybody will know sure. about hierarchy. Okay. So if, it's, if it's a sort of treatment. So, so essentially, the, the best, highest quality of evidence you can have is a systematic review, because that would include everything that's been done on that question. So right. if you want any piece of evidence at all, it should be in a systematic review. So that's the highest. Sure. The second highest would be something like, again, depends a bit on the question, would be something like a meta-analysis, where you've statistically in ways summarized to look at the effect size of different treatments on a particular outcome. So the best is a systematic review, which would also include the meta-analyses. The next level down would be something like, again, in medicine, a randomized control trial, or even in management, you can imagine doing something like that. If you're interested, only if you're interested in treatment effects. If you're interested in something else, randomized control trials are pointless. So again, it depends on your question. Moving further down, you might get sort of more descriptive studies, perhaps more qualitative stuff, if you're interested in impact of a treatment. Right at the bottom, you get expert opinion. But again, that's a hierarchy, and I think it's much better to think of lots of different hierarchies depending on your question. I have at the bottom of, by the way, this is on page 274. The model Rob talked about at the beginning is on 274 of my book, and this hierarchy is on 275, more or less the same. I have below expert advice, I have cause and effect narratives from personal experience. So, um, and in management, I have well, to say. I well, I slightly push back against that because I think cause and effect narratives from, from, from personal experience can be extremely reliable. Right. What about if you are going back to food? What about if you're a great cook or a really good chef where you know how to bake stuff? You may yep. have strong cause effect narratives about, well, does this cake look ready? Well, actually, I think the top looks a bit weird and this oven's a bit different. And actually, it could be from experience. You've been through that as a professional cook or a very good amateur cook. You might have been through that experience hundreds and hundreds of times, in which case I would say your causal narrative from personal experience is very, very high quality evidence. So again, even in that, I think it always depends on your question and what kind of evidence you're talking about. You know, it does. And I, I wrote this in a maybe a too scientific way. So I, I have the bottom three is case studies, expert advice, and cause and effect narratives from personal experience. And I guess as a management consultant who's 25 years, God help me, in the profession, about 99.99% of what I see managers try and do is they're relying on some cause and effect narrative from yes. their personal experience. Sure. Yeah. They're gotten ex- uh, some guru that they read Right. something in the Har- Harvard Business Review, or maybe, and th- even this is rare, they've like read a, case, read a case study. So those are, oh my gosh, in the world that I fly in the ha- Harvard Business Review world, the business guru world, that's all of it. I don't sure. know anybody who yeah. says, oh gee, I want something to happen in hu- human resources. I wonder you know, what the evidence might suggest. I wonder if there's any new research, right. or I wonder if there are any new ideas. The gap between the work, well, I say you're on the bridge between theory and practice, but the academic organizational uh, psychologist, management strategist, business school professor, and what managers do day to day, from my point of view, it's a chasm. It's the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And also, Um, what you picked up on there is a really, really interesting point. And again, this is something when we're training and teaching about this, we talk to managers about a lot. It's one of the problems is for, for managerial decisions, you're not like a baker you have not been through precisely the same experience in the controlled conditions so many times that you can actually learn from experience. And this is one of the real challenge, challenges for management. As you know, there are various conditions for expertise. One is a predictable and stable environment or relatively stable environment. The other thing is extremely clear and measurable outcomes. Another yep. one is that you can link what you did to what happened. Uh, and another is getting great feedback. So an example might be learning to play a musical instrument. That has all those conditions. You can literally, if you're playing guitar, you can pluck a string and you know exactly what it sounds like and you can change it immediately. 
The problem for managers who are making often quite complex decisions, they have none of those features. It's a changing environment. The outcomes are often rather unclear. They don't have much control over, over the situation. And the feedback is often quite poor. So again, it's this issue about people are taking stuff quite naturally from one context, like, yes, I can learn from experience, and applying it to a context where actually you can't learn too much from experience. And that for a lot of managers is, is not a message they necessarily want to hear because they think you're saying to them, you don't know anything. And of course, that's not what you're saying. You're saying for some kinds of decisions, you need to look at other sources of evidence because your own experience for this kind of question is probably not very useful. Yeah, typically, you know, I mean, as an example, I've probably bored people with, I've given it so often in my writings, but, you know, I get called into a call center and the guy at the call center, the manager says, the call center is not performing. Can you, Mr. Gibbons, really motivate my people? They need a training course to motivate them. And there are so many flaws with that kind of reasoning, but it doesn't take very long to think about all the ways that a call center can be not functioning. It can be shitty product, or bad marketing, it can be a bad strategy, it could be the managers are jerks, the working conditions pay can be poor. I mean, there's a million different things that can be causing, uh, you know, a shit product. <laughs> and a lot of those, but very common, the diagnosis of the problem will be, my people need to be motivated. And then also implicitly, they're making a cause and effect relationship between yes, employee exactly. motivation yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and performance, which, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're an organizational psychologist, probably the, the second day of the course, you learned that the link between motivation and performance is you know, far from crystal clear, and it's certainly not one way. And so that's, I guess, what I'm trying to counter indeed with some of my writing is this idea that, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years, and I know what's what. And if my call center is not working, well, we better well motivate people and we'll get this guru guy, Paul Gibbons, to come in and, you know, spread some pixie dust on them and motivate them. Yeah. And I just such bollocks and they're wasting their money. And again, yeah. And that example, again, with the cause effect narrative, I think also what you picked up in that example, which I would agree in my limited experience is quite a common one, is that there's not sufficient focus on what the problem is. Right. So Quick, in that clear. sense, yeah. what someone has done is not only gone for a cause effect thing that may or may not be there, they've said, well, the problem is people aren't motivated. Well, that you've got, there's a lot of leaps in logic from saying, no kidding, know, right? we've got problems with customer service quality or with people who've got high turnover or people aren't making as many calls. It's a big thing for saying that is a problem to what might be causing it. So again, in our training, we spend a huge amount of time trying to get people to really focus on stop thinking about solutions, stop thinking about solutions, stop think about the problem. And in fact, in some of the exercises we do, we get people to sort of use a real example. And we sort of spend half a day saying, you're not even allowed to think about the solution yet. And it's astounding how much people want to do that. Uh, they want to get quickly to let's fix this, let's fix this, not what is the problem. And the idea, this comes back to things like cognitive ease and system on system two and those kinds of ideas. But actually, it's just more effort. It's much more effortful, I think, thinking about and trying to get evidence for and understanding the nature of problems. That's kind of quite hard work and quite boring. It's much more fun to do stuff and fix stuff. And that's what people often tend to want to go to really, really quickly. And inevitably, if they do that, the chances they've identified the problem are quite small. The chances the solution they're imposing will fix the problem is probably about zero because yeah, they yeah. don't know what the problem is. So I think it's it, those sort of, again, this kind of, to me, quite natural things we want to do is fix stuff, make things right. Great. But actually, what's the problem? Of course, and of course, the time pressures are, you know, I mean, I think in my book, I talk about that sort of evidence people and the I've got a job to do people. And you yes. say, well, you know, have you considered this? And have you considered this? Yeah. And if I can curse on my own podcast, I guess I can't curse on my own. They say, fuck off, mate. I've got a job to do. You know, I don't have time to <laughs> stop yeah. wasting my time with um, with uh, this exactly. thing. I mean, you know, and those yeah, pressures yeah, yeah. are, of course, real. And what it means is people do the same thing over and over and over again. If I've got a hammer, it must be a nail, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it also yeah. means they do, they do quick fixes. They sort of, and again, like most quick fixes, they don't work. And you have to try and find another quick fix and another quick fix. So I, and for me... I don't think my sense of this is that it's not an individual manager problem. It's the way in which managers are incentivized and rewarded. So if you're rewarded for doing things fast, if you're rewarded for getting things done sure, rather sure. than for doing what works, then of course you're going to find, try and fix things really fast because that's what you're rewarded for. If you say to, if you're, you say to your boss, well, I've been trying to work out the problem for the last two months, in some contexts that might be quite appreciated. In other contexts, like, what the hell are you doing? Just do something about it. 
Absolutely, yeah. Don't bring me. Here's another piece of management dogma, right? So the kind of people who follow sort of go, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions, which is, of course, terrible advice. (laughs) Yes, it is. It is. And of course, all this stuff, again, I'm sure you're familiar with it, or some of your listeners are, this idea of solutioneering, where you, which again is very important for evidence based practice and general rules of evidence based management, where, as you, in the example you gave, you define a problem by the absence of the solution. Like the problem is our staff aren't motivated enough. No, that is not the problem. The problem might be you're losing customers. The problem might be, as I said, the quality of, of yeah. customer care. That's the problem. A five wise kind of analysis says they yeah, talk the about the system. Not, very useful. You don't have training. So I think I think that that, that, that kind of rushed a solution. And the idea that there are lots of solutions out there that potentially seem at least superficially quite appealing i think drives people to define yeah define the issue around the the solution they don't have right very well put define the issue the problem in terms of a solution they don't like have like we need a training course the problem here is absence of a training course not you know time to market or quality or yeah yeah, and, and again, another one of my favorite examples around this field at the moment, a currently fashionable thing, certainly in HR, is employee engagement. And again, when I get a chance, I'm talking about this to HR practitioners, I often say to them, what is the, what's the problem that low engagement is actually causing? Because they often say low engagement is a problem, you've got to increase it. And, and in 98% of cases, they don't know. But the, 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 but I the, hear solution, that all the, time. the solution is to increase engagement. If you say, well, why? What was the problem? Well, it's obvious. It's performance. It's turnover. It's motive. Well, what's the link? Well, we don't really know, but we need to do this. We need to increase. Well, they've read somewhere in a book that engagement, you know, is sure. is yeah. the holy holy grail. Uh, yeah. It's kind of interesting. You know, I I don't take this the wrong way, but you'd be a very good management consultant. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, I don't, I'm not sure that's a couple. So listen, what's uh? So take you know a workaday HR manager, right? So. And let's be specific about the problem. Say it's recruitment and selection, or say it's you know some narrower part of the HR world. What's an evidence-based practitioner doing that someone who's perhaps less schooled in this way of thinking about business problems? What are they doing? Yeah, okay, great question. I was actually doing I was actually doing a session on this this week for uh, part of the UK civil service HR. So what what they will be doing as an example? Let's take a really kind of mundane example because i think it's it's, i think it's important to look at some basics something like employee absence so i think what an evidence-based hr person would be doing around employee absence is firstly not thinking at all about any solutions they'd just be focusing on the problem to begin with and essentially what they'd be doing is looking across those four areas so practice practitioner expertise organizational data scientific evidence and stakeholder perceptions to say what is the problem with absence and asking quite basic questions. So, for example, they might ask of their own expertise or the teams, what do we think is going on? Do we think we've got a problem of absence? Why do we think it's a problem as practitioners? Then looking at organizational right. data, what actually is the rate of absence? What are the trends? Are the patterns? Can we see anything going on that makes us think it's a problem? And if there is absence going on and it's 5%, 6 why is that a problem? Why actually is that a problem? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Again, scientific evidence. What's the scientific evidence that organizations that have higher or lower absence actually, what problems does that cause? And also stakeholders. If you go to your customers and clients and say, look, we think we've got a problem with absence, what do you think? And they go, gosh, we don't even notice it. Well, kind of, that's pretty interesting. Or they say, well, we do yes. notice it because there's total discontinuity of when we, we, right. when we fix things. So you do that across those four sources. And again, always thinking about the reliability and quality and trustworthy evidence. Say, so firstly, have we got a problem? What kind of problem is it? If you think right, you, so that's a yeah. problem definition part. You're talking yeah. to stakeholders. Yeah. You're looking at the data, like what are our absenteeism rates. You're looking at relative data from other things. So you're getting some things. You've got evidence, and the difference between evidence and data, as you're describing it, I think if I want to, I'll try and clarify it for listeners. Is data is actually like what's happening? Happy. We're we're talking about evidence. What we're talking about is causal relationships, really. Like if I do X, Y will happen, kind of yeah. right. But yeah, and I I sort of tend to. Although there are kinds all sorts of technical distinctions you can make between. Evidence evidence and data and information and stuff like that i sort of tend to say it doesn't really matter that much let's just call it evidence 
it, let's keep it broad because it could be lots of different things. And it, but it, it may be causal, but it may also be entirely descriptive. So, for example, right, right, you right. might look in detail at your sort of you know, absence trends for the last year across thousands of employees in thousands of hundreds of locations. And actually, really, that's, just, that's, that's data. Yeah, but you really would describe in detail, not even at this point, interest in cause and effect. You may just say, what is going on here? What might be going on? It's higher there than there. It doesn't mean it's a causal effect. It's lower here. It goes up at Christmas. It goes down at Thanksgiving, whatever. You know, it's getting a sense of what might be going on. As a scientist, that would be the first step of the scientific method. The first step of a scientific investigation would be to observe the world in a systematic way and make some hypothesis about what might be going on, what might be happening here. Well, that would so be the, that would be the ideal of science. It doesn't happen so much, but that would be the doesn't ideal. Doesn't always yes. happen that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, so, so certainly, the, the an HR manager or HR team that would do that would really get into what is this problem, what's going on. And indeed, what might typically happen is once they've done that, they may realize well. It's not the problem we thought it was, or it's actually two problems. It could be three problems. Which is just just save them a shit ton of money, right? Potentially. Or what <laughs> what we see in the in the, in the what we see in the kind of headline figure of absence is actually a whole load of really long term absences. Our short term absences, they're kind of okay. It's three days a year. That's fine. We think it's okay, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's, it's yeah. long term. So what are those long term absences? And immediately when you see that in the data, that's a completely different kind of problem than if you right. treated it as another kind of absence problem and threw different things at it. So once you were reasonably clear about what the problem might be, I guess the issue is only again, going through those same four sources of evidence or data again is to say what might the solutions be? What do we know from science? What do we know from our experience? What does the organizational data say may be the solutions, you know, the things we can manipulate and change? And that's where you're right. That's where the more cause and effect come in. And also what do our stakeholders think of the solution? So, for example, what do managers think? You know, great potential solution to absence is to do return to work interviews. And you may talk to your line manager and say, you know what, we're the HR team. We've decided if any member of your team is off for more than two days when they come back to work, you have to interview them to ask them why. Your line managers might say, you know what, we're not going to do that <laughs> because A, it takes <laughs> a lot of time and B, you know, I'm not the absence police. I've got trust with my team members. If I start interviewing them, Sure, it might reduce absence, but they're no longer going to trust me anymore. So again, talking to stakeholders in that sense is partly about, say, asking them in their experience and understanding, given their concerns, is this solution in this case actually going to work? You know, and they might have some incredibly valid, reliable, and trustworthy views that you might, might take into account. So this is the key thing to me about evidence-based practice, whether it's in medicine or, or, or any kind of field, is it is so crucial to look across those sorts of information. So, and the parallel, I guess, would be with medicine, you'd also try and look at what the patient and what their family thought about the treatment or intervention, what their views were. You may have a ton yeah. of RCTs that say, if you do this, it will have this effect. But actually, if the patient, the family, the context, the situation – doesn't fit isn't right for that then you wouldn't just impose you know a whole load of rct results on an individual patient and it's exactly the same i think in management yes i think uh, there's a three-legged stool in evidence-based management isn't it there's clinical expertise stakeholder family wishes and cultural norms and then what the evidence says what the research paper says the most yeah. effective way to intervene and you've got a four bit model, which I will repeat for people, what do stakeholders think about the problem? Because they're going to be the people who implement the solution. So having an expertise or an H some HR guy weighing in and saying, I'm from HR, right. here's what you ought to do. And then praying to God that the stakeholders accept the solution is rational. And, 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 it, and it's your employees and it's also yeah. your customers and clients. And it might be the wider community. There's a lot, you know, for organizations, there's potentially yeah. quite a lot of stakeholders there. Yeah. Yeah, and there's an elegance to that too, because not only are you engaging them in your thinking and in the evidence process and the problem solving process as well, which will be useful, but you're also getting data from how they see the problem. And you, you, you know, without talking to them, without engaging with them, you wouldn't you wouldn't have the the benefits of that. So, so sure. stakeholders, and then data, what's happening, evidence, which I too narrowly described as what's in the papers you mean it much you what you know what science says but you're saying it's actually much broader it's everything from individual you know uh, first-hand experience to expertise to case studies I to think super so, yeah. duper yeah. yeah and then experience like you know what does you as a manager 
I write a little bit about this. The manager leadership and management as a craft, you know, like the sure, you use a cooking yes. co cooking example about it is like, okay, yeah. let's not disregard the fact you've done this for 30 years and you have, you know, deep craft like knowledge of what works. And I think that's the thing that managers really freak out about when I read some of the stuff on LinkedIn about it is you'll post something on evidence based management or some other guy will and then there'll be these horrified managers. You're going to turn me into a robot and all of the things that I value about myself, which is my experience and my management as a craft. And you're going to throw that all out. And I'm going to be some guy that's just going to have to, you know, look at the, you know, annual review of organizational psychology exactly. and yeah. do what these academic twerks, you know, want me to do. I, I don't want to do, you know, I've got a bloody job to do. I don't want to live my life like that. Yeah. So yeah. that's their heart. They're horrified, you know, sometimes. Yeah. And, and I, that, that, I think is a misconception what evidence based management is, as I've just described. It, it, it is, but I, I mean, what would you, that reaction what would, and I'd have to say, of course, yeah. 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 I mean, that's their identity is I'm, I'm a manager and that confers yeah. upon me. I know what the fuck to do when there's a problem. But what they think that we're saying is, oh, no, you don't, pal. Exactly. Yeah. And I suppose I could criticize my own writing because kind of what I see, I've seen in my long history as a magic consultant is lots of people piss away money doing stupid things that disregard the evidence, you know, pay for performance or engagement and motivation training without really consulting the evidence and without really identifying the problem. So I suppose I wrote it from a very particular mm. perspective is that, corporations, people always criticize the public sector for hemorrhaging money. I don't think they spend enough time in the private sector. The amount of money they hemorrhage doing stupid things, which they haven't consulted the stakeholders, they haven't got any good data, they don't understand cause and effect, and they rely over heavily, I think, on their own sort of godlike experience about I'm, I've been doing this for 30 years and I know what's what. And if I don't know it, it's probably not worth knowing. And so I guess I was addressing myself at that particular kind of manager leader when I wrote my stuff. Yeah. And I, and I think, and I think there are, there's a sort of, of course I get, you know, in any context, there can be sort of some arrogance in that. And clearly if you yeah. give anybody a lot of power and high rewards, they're going to start you know, believing, <laughs> believing the hype, you know, that they are sort of have these magical, powers and so on uh, and to me of course some of you know i guess to me some of the the best my view about what the best managers would be are people who actually can say yeah i don't understand i don't know what's going on but i know how to find out and that in a sense sure, sure. is what evidence-based management is all about it's not having it's not knowing everything but it's knowing how to find stuff out and that's the fundamental difference i think so let's talk about some of the, these critiques right mm. because sure. I, I absolutely was sold and myself and I, as i said when i when i wrote my little book it was probably about 12 pages on evidence based management and it was something like that i was very much like this is the way the world needs to go it needs to go this way in education it needs to go this way in public policy it needs to go this way in medicine like evidence based is you know the direction that we need to head as a society and i suppose i could be accused of scientism or positivism and so this conversation has actually been really illuminating for me because you think about things much more broadly than than I do, despite the fact that you're the guy that's in the university and I'm the guy that's the so-called management consultant, which is quite interesting. But so let's go through some of the things that people mm -hmm. criticize and some of the reasons that sure. those might be misunderstandings. Let's say, why don't you just go through some of the criticisms or some of the attacks on this and what would well, we think, say about this? I mean, you've already given one, which is more of an attack, I guess, from a management or practitioner point of view, is that is yeah. they say, I'm saying I can't use my experience. Now, no, absolutely not. It's one of the four sources of evidence, so we're not saying that. I think another critique is often that, that it is privileging science and certain kinds of science above everything else. And again, it isn't, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, because you know, there are, there are huge problems with science, in my view, of all kinds. And it, a lot of it's very untrustworthy and not very well done and extremely poor quality evidence. Mm. And also what counts as good scientific evidence, again, to me, always depends on your question. So, for example, I think one of the critiques is saying, oh, are you saying that a randomized control trial and experiment is the only thing that counts? Absolutely not. It depends on the question. So I think a lot of these criticisms are sort of slightly decontextualized. They think that evidence-based practice is a is a completely fixed thing which prioritizes certain sorts of uh, knowledge above others and that it has to be followed. It's like a, a diktat. Well, it isn't. Evidence-based practice is about what people do using different kinds of evidence and information depending on the questions and the problems they're actually facing. So that's another critique. 
I think another one is that people say things like, oh, you know, we haven't got time, we haven't got time. Yep. We've touched yep. on this already. And again, one of the responses is, well, do you want to do what works or do you just want to do stuff? Now, if you want to do stuff, that's fine. If you want to do what works, then yes, it takes time. And the other thing, again, when we're training in, in this, we, you know, often people say, well, I have to make decisions really, really quickly. You know, I haven't got time for this. So we often do a little test. It's a little trick. It nearly always works. We say, right, sit, you know, sit down. Just sit for four or five minutes. Tell us a decision in the last six months in your job you had to make really quickly. And guess what the results are? Almost hmm. none. <laughs> and where right. they are quickly is because they, they knew they had to make a decision six months down the line, but actually didn't start thinking about it till the week before. <laughs> so I think there's that people feel things are fast, but they are. And of course, even when people give emergency situations, you say, well, actually, if you're in a high reliability organization where there's going to be these kinds of emergencies, actually, you know, part of being evidence-based is planning for it. It's saying, if we get contaminated, if we get glass in our baby food, we need a plan. We need an evidence-based plan in place now in case that happens. So we don't have to search all the evidence about how you manage the general public, how do you recall food, how do you, you know, you, it's already ready to run. And a good example of that is the famous example of Solly Sollenberg who you know, ditched his plane in the Hudson. And, you know, he had to make very quick decisions, but everything he did was based actually on a huge amounts of evidence, but he had sure. prepared for it. So I think that kind of, I've got to do things fast doesn't quite, sort of wash for me i think they're probably some of the main criticisms and i think what i think the great thing is once you actually say let's work on a real problem that you're dealing with right now in your organization i think usually those all those criticisms just wither away because if well let's triple underline real problem. problem too because i think one of the things that you said that should be enlightening for listeners is that problem identification is i think this is a tribute to einstein he almost certainly didn't say it but you know if i had oh yeah 20, 24 hours just to, to to save the world i'd spend 23 and a half hours thinking about the problem right. and half an hour thinking about the solution he almost certainly didn't say that but anyway it's attributed to einstein but you know you do we do, because I'm, I'm going to include myself in your camp, do think about a hierarchy of evidence. And when I think about a conversation I had with a guy 20 years ago, I was probably your student at the time, and he was head of mergers and acquisitions for PricewaterhouseCoopers, you know, made $5 million a year and, you know, sort of a $40,000 watch consulting partner guy. And he came in and he gave us a talk on the mergers and acquisitions practice. And I was there as the kind of HROD guy. And he said, one of the things you have to get right is you've got to pay people a lot of money to motivate them and get them to perform. And of course, I was a smart arse. I was 35 and something like that. I said, of course, you know that you know the, the relationship between pay and motivation and between motivation and performance. He said, at best, it's uncertain. And certainly, it doesn't work as straightforwardly as you think it works. And the guy turned purple. And I know we didn't get to much of an argument about it. And he said something like, of course, paying people more makes them more motivated and work harder. Shut the fuck up in parentheses. You know, so here we are. Yeah. And I think the other, I mean, another, this reminds me a lot of another sort of barrier. He yeah. gets into thinking about quotes, again, the Einstein sort of possible misquote. But another <laughs> yeah. one is, uh, again, this is a misquote too, apparently. It, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Yeah, I've heard that from about 100 people, including Mark exactly. Twain, yeah. Albert Einstein, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's the idea yeah. that, that strong and wrong beliefs are really problem problematic. Ignorance, actually, in contrast, is okay. Because typically ignorance means you're going to try and find out. And the huge danger, I think, in any practice, yeah. whether it's a consultant or a manager or a doctor, whoever it is, or an educator or a policymaker or a politician, dare I say, it, the huge problem is having these very strong beliefs that you actually haven't really checked out. They could be correct, more or less, or they could be terrible. But I would say my quality of evidence is higher than his. Like he's yeah. got his you know, gut and his quote unquote experience. I, I've been doing this for 40 years. Uh, shut up, pencil neck. And I've got, yeah. I'm, t I'm doing a master's in organizational psychology with Professor Breener and he thinks you're full of shit. So, <laughs> we, <I don't>, you know, <laughs> well, it's not ad hominem. I mean, all the research says yeah. that those, those relationships yeah. are very difficult to establish and they're not certain and they're not, and they're not causal in the way we think, right? So, yeah, there's, there's a bit, and also, I mean, like with a lot of these things, it's a huge, it depends. 
So just as an example, pay and performance, is it linked? Well, it depends, you know, it depends what you do, what pay, what kind of performance, what you mean. Is there a general relationship? No. But again, it's this, it's this sort of nuance. And again, I hear not only practitioners, but occasionally academics and students saying, we're sick of saying it depends. We're sick of you saying it depends. And it's always like to say it depends is yeah, usually, which is just what like, they don't want to hear. They want a fast answer. They don't want to hear it depends. But it depends is usually the right answer to, it the often right answer is. to most questions. Even the question, would you like a pizza? Well, it depends where from. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, it's funny. Uh, there's, a, there's a quote I love, which probably is an accurate quote. It's from Harry Truman, uh, president in the United States, I think 45, 49. And he said, can someone please give me a one-handed economist? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> because yes, because right, economists yeah. are famous yeah. for on the one hand, but on the other hand, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. I think it depends is right. And then I always say, well, and it's our job as practitioners or research to say what it just depends on. Yes. So saying it depends is not avoiding the answer. It's actually trying to give a better answer. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, and that's where scholars and academics are really great because they are do spend their life trying to understand the contingencies and what things depend upon. Yeah. That, that's your job, a phrase a different way. Let's talk generally about the gap between theory and practice. Like, because let's go, let's go up above the evidence-based world for a moment sure. and and talk about do you actually work in a business school? No, you work in the organizational yeah, psychology. I do, yeah. you work in a business yeah, school. I do. Yeah. And so, so, and you know, I remember when I went to university in the 1970s, the business school at the University of Wisconsin was, I don't know, four or 500 people. And it was a little shack in the back of the campus. And nobody in those days who, none of my high school peers who were able at all would dream of going, doing an undergraduate in business. Now the business school is the biggest thing on campus by orders of magnitude bigger than any other business. And it's got probably more faculty did today than it had students 40 years ago. <laughs> you know, it's got yeah. 300, 400 faculty or something like that. And so, you know, it's quite an industry. Why is there such a, I mean, I don't know, this, let's leave this super open. What is the gap between theory and practice and, and why does it exist and how could we close it? Do you mean theory and practice or do you mean something else? I don't know. Because I think, I th I think practitioners use theory all the time. And I think academics often don't really use theory. Anything ah, that's theory. interesting. All right, let's, let's hear this. This was they, interesting. They I think when people say the gap, you're right, people, it's often framed or described as theory and practice. I think probably what people more precisely mean by that is a sort of gap between what is published in scientific journals, what researchers and scientists in the field of management are working on, and what is going on in an organization. Okay. I think, I think that's really what the gap is. So it's not so much theory and practice, it's more that gap. And I would say a couple of things about that. The first is, and this, sound, this is going to sound odd, I don't know if gap is the best metaphor to describe it. Sure. What I mean by that is there's, there's a gap between lots of things, and those gaps are often fine, necessary, not a problem. I think what people are getting at in our field, or management in particular, talk about this gap, is what they mean is there's somehow a disconnect between what is known scientifically about stuff, and the, as you said in your examples earlier, and how people are practicing. Now, if there is that kind of, and the gap, of course, maybe the other way around, the gap is what, how people are practicing in organizations is not understood by science. So in that sense, it's a sort of, it's a sort of potentially a sort of two-way gap, which is not in itself a problem. So to me, the issue is more about what are the intermediaries? How do you develop a process that feeds back more from a scientist who, generally speaking, are interested in practice to practitioners who perhaps not so interested in science, and my experience is they actually are. Right. Uh, so how do you actually make sure that there's a flow of information and knowledge between those two that's spheres? A great way that's, of, that's a great way of framing the question. Yeah, I think it's sort of, I think it's, that's sort of more of the problem. And, and, and what I sense is that certainly the kind of, certainly in some fields there is a gap. I don't think it, I don't th and I'm not seeing this as a deficit because actually I think often what scientists and, and researchers do in management and business I think they have a very poor understanding of actually of organizations and they deploy many constructs, models, ideas, they measure stuff that not only is dubious scientifically, that actually is of so little relevance and, and to actually what people do at work. And I think that's a problem. I don't mean it's relevant in the sense that you can't use it in practice. It's not really based much on what is happening in organizations. So as you know, for example, in psychology, people might con construct a new construct. They measure it with a scale. It's right. got two dimensions. And then they spent the next 25 years of their lives 
looking at all the things it might correlate with in cross-sectional questionnaires. Right, right. <laughs> I would say scientifically, it's pretty much, not them personally, it's pretty much a waste of time. But they will build a career. So yeah. the issue is it's not that there's a sort of gap. It's more, it's more that the two, if, it, if there are two groups, they're pursuing separate activities. Scientists have their own uh, kind of rewards. They have their in- incentive systems. They have their own methods. And they tend to do what will get them rewarded. And I'm sure you're aware of all the stuff around this at the moment, the sort of crises in science. And Reproducibility. So to me, that's absolutely no different from a manager. As you said before, a manager who's rewarded for doing things fast, getting things done, is under exactly the same pressures as a professor in a business school who says, yeah, I need to churn out five articles this year in these kinds of journals. Yeah. They're under exactly the same pressures. Now, I would say in the case of the yeah. academic, if they are under that kind of pressure, they are ultimately not adding much value to the pursuit of science or knowledge. Well, I, I actually think you know, you, there's, a, there's a book on this that wants to be written, but you've said to me that the reward system in uh, UK academia and probably in the US to a slightly lesser extent is you can't really write books because you've got to churn out peer-reviewed papers. Well, for example, that, that's one of the issues, but it's also the short-termism. If you say to your dean of your business school, you know what, I'm not going to publish anything for five years for working on this big complex problem which I don't even know has an answer, that will be unacceptable. You should be all right as a full professor, though. You should be able to... No, 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 not these days. It wouldn't really make much difference. Maybe in the States it's different in Canada and other places, but in the UK, yeah, it still would be very much a problem. Well, I think the US might be more enlightened because they know that if Jeffrey Pfeffer writes a book on evidence-based management, which, by the way, he's written written a very good book. It's good for the business school. It's good for Stanford. They're probably thinking about it along the right kind of lines. Like, it's not a waste of money and it's not self-promotion at the expense of the university. Yeah, and possibly it is different in the States. But I, I guess my, my feeling is that for every practitioner, so, and again, I've, I've spoken about a lot of this to friends, to colleagues in lots of different fields. If you say to them, what does your, what's your job really about? They'll say, well, it's about improving this, doing that, making sure the organization right. functions better, making sure, what do you actually do? Well, I just do stuff because someone else told me to do stuff mm-hmm. uh, and I have to do it to get promoted and not get into trouble. I don't really know why I'm doing some of it, but it sort of makes sense, but I don't really know. And it's the same for scientists, managers, teachers, lots of other people end up doing stuff. They're not really sure why they're doing it, but it's what's kind of rewarded. So I think uh, that gap, I'd say, is I think the manager or many managers, many academics are in the same situation as going for short-term goals, doing stuff that will get them rewarded, perhaps in the end not contributing to the organization in a way to the organization they belong to, but they're certainly hitting targets. They're certainly hitting numbers. But is that really what value in the end is that adding? And I think it's a similar process. So to me, addressing that gap is not so much about pushing one set of evidence on another group of people. Uh, to me, that, that gap is about saying, let's think about the problem. And indeed, from a management point of view, if you think about the problem and you look to the scientific evidence, it may turn out to be incredibly useful, very valid, extremely relevant. It may turn out to be terrible, low quality, non-existent. But that's the great thing about evidence-based management. You don't know till you find out. And that's the point. That's so a, to that's me, addressing <laughs> It's an interesting truism that has a certain profundity. You don't know until you find out. <laughs> that could be, to me, addressing the gap is not about saying to business school professors, you have to go and talk to organizations or to have seminars. If that's not... You have to start with where, what people are trying to do and what people are trying to tackle with, that you start with that. Then you say, okay, what evidence might help us? And indeed, what business schools produce may be one of those sources. It's certainly a source you should look at, but it's it's to push it around to do, to try and force it on people. I just don't think works. You have to start from where people are and the problems they're dealing with. Well, you know, it's funny. One of the things that I'm thinking a lot about today is the interaction of expertise with democratic processes. And we've got mm. a huge problem in the United States and basically yeah. the world is you've got expertise, say it's the EPA, say it's the Centers for Disease Control and Vaccination, say they're economists, say they're people who are experts in criminology who understand something about the way the prison system ought to work, whoever. You have expertise and then you have politicians yeah. and politicians are following the what Keynes called animal spirits to a large extent. They're not experts. And you have people who, you know, something as complicated as Brexit, they don't understand it. But what's not working today is trust me, I'm an expert and this is what you should do. It doesn't work in climate change, it yeah. doesn't work in vaccination. And so one of the things that 
we really, I think, wrestle with the probably this is a this is the project for this century is how we reconcile expertise, which is demanded of us in a really complicated world. I mean, the world, the consumer yeah. world, the voting world, the global, you know, whatever you want to call it, is much more complicated than 120. Years. The day to day life of a human being today is a lot more complicated than 120 years ago. And so we want to engage people in decisions that are morally relevant to them, in which they have a stake. But also, we don't sure. want to disregard the fact that there are people who know shit, and you know. If, a climate scientist who's been doing something for studying climate for 40 years, I back him as knowing more than, you know, a guy who's living in a trailer in Virginia. That sounds terribly classist. But we want to engage that guy who's living in the trailer in Virginia with the expertise in a way that's different than we yeah. do now. And that seems to be, you know, this almost goes back to Plato as how he thought society should be run. You know, he thought democracy was a very bad idea because you'd have people who are basically ignorant making decisions about the future of the world. Uh, to some extent, you know, that's the way the world seems to be going with, you know, sort of Trump-like things and Brexit-like things is that, you sure. know, so, so that's our thing is how do you, because we trust experts less and less, but we need them more and more, which is, is a weird yeah. thing, right? We'd actually, the more complex the world. Uh, well, is, yeah. I may, uh, I may give you an answer that will surprise you. I don't think we should trust experts. Uh, <laughs> all right. Talk to me about that. <laughs> okay. The, one of the problems with experts and expertise is not always, but generally speaking, yeah. Most experts have been doing their thing for a long time, right? Which is what makes them experts. Yeah. They are super biased. <laughs> they are super predisposed to bigging up their subject, their area, the phenomena, the thing they've studied. It's really rare you get, say, an expert who says, I spent 30 years of my life doing this thing. And you know what? I've just realized. It was all it a bunch of bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, right. Uh, I, don't, I think it probably sometimes happens, but it's rare. So going back to cognitive biases, one of the problems are experts. I think we shouldn't trust experts. Yeah. I think experts are terrible sources of evidence. I think experts are great for helping us understand things, to explain things, to help us understand the evidence. Yeah. But in the end, I think it's the evidence that's much more important than what experts the Evidence tell you is about. more important than the expert. That is think, right. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's all kinds of examples where people have made all kinds of mistakes. In other words, you get the problem that the expert is held up as being the font of wisdom. They are not. Or they are up to a point. They are about some things, but not necessarily about evidence. Again, it's very much overlapping with eminence. So often, often experts are eminent, and if you, you know, there's all kinds of problems with people being eminent as well. That we tend to, you know, have overconfidence in what they're telling us or what they're saying. And the problem is, and there's been a few studies of this, even in business and management. If you take academics as experts, often they actually don't. Why would they really understand the entire body of scientific evidence? They just don't, because why would they? They're not walking meta-analyses machines. <laughs> they do their own thing. They do their own studies. They may be very successful or whatever, or not so successful in that, but they just don't. They're not walking around constantly evaluating every single piece of published and unpublished data about question or issue. So they're just not very good sources of evidence, because as always, what is important in any context is it's the body of evidence that counts. Not a single study, not a few studies, not a few data points. It's all, everything you can get hold of. And generally speaking, experts just don't have that. I think that's I'm not great. saying experts aren't, aren't useful for some things important. Of course they are. But I think we give, in other words, we give them too much emphasis perhaps. At the same time, I agree that some of the anti-expert stuff is actually more anti-science stuff, and that's a different problem. That is a different problem. So, th so it's interesting. I mean, one thing I suppose that should give us some pause for hope and some pause for humility is the adaptation of evidence-based practice in medicine. Even though medicine is like on the face of it, like super duper science, see much more than business or social sciences, has not gone down. It didn't go down, you know, like a spoonful of honey. You know, it wasn't as if there were you know, half a million doctors in the world said, oh, no. thank God, you know, in 1996 when the seminal paper was published. Oh, thank and God. And you indeed finally still, told us what we're doing it. wrong. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm so grateful to you. You know, no, they, they the doctors, uh, ostensibly science-y, you know, were basing their medical decisions on tradition and what they learned in medical school 40 yeah. years ago and what their buddies were doing and what the drug companies were paying them to prescribe and, you know, not evidence-based by... I don't want to say by any stretch of the imagination, that's probably hyperbole, but you know what I mean? Not nearly as evidence-based as you'd think a science-y type procession should be. No, it's certainly not evidence-based in the sense of adopting an explicit model of, of decision-making. Right, no. yes. And so I think that's changed a lot. It's changed a lot, but I would say even in medicine, there are still really 
serious problems with how evidence-based medicine has played out right. and how it's evolved, which I think in evidence-based management we can kind of start to learn from. And I think one of the ways it's played out and it has been very hard is that there has been a sense in which medical practitioners feel that there are some evidence police who are sort of telling them this is what science says. And by the way, you mentioned it before, I think science says is a, is a sort of really hollow phrase. Yeah. Science says... Yeah. The science doesn't say anything, and it's just information that that's sort right. of might point. Yeah, to science says it's like supposed to be the trump card, though, For right? Now. It's supposed it's, to be the argument, is, the exactly, trump yeah. card. Research says, yeah, uh, research you, says, science says yeah. yeah, we know from science, and that these are my trigger words for if somebody might be full of shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. So trigger, trigger expressions. But the, but the point is, I mean, yeah. I think there was a sense in which, which is like you doctors, you medical practitioners, you're useless, you do terrible stuff, we're going to tell you what works. Here you go. Here's some meta-analyses. Here's some systematic reviews. You have to do this. Now, obviously, in some contexts, some ways, that's very, very sensible and a good idea. However, when the science is weak or flawed and consistent, yeah. it then irritates the hell out of practitioners. You say, what are we supposed to do with this? Yeah, exactly. So I think that's partly why there's been a re-emphasis in more recent years in evidence-based medicine. Yeah. So I was thinking more broadly about evidence, really taking the stakeholder stuff seriously. Really well, it's, gr it's growing up, right? Issues. It's growing up. I mean, it's yeah, 25 absolutely. years old, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, now. and I think that's something we can learn. So I think, as you mentioned, I think management's going through a bit of a scientist or being in awe of science, you know, kind of phase at the moment with things like big data, data, data analytics, experiments, nudge, randomized control trials, where there's a bit kind of in awe of, oh, they did an experiment, or, oh, Google did that. It was amazing. You know, yeah. you kind of think, wait, look, this is just one study, one piece of evidence. That's great. But, you know, you've got to incorporate it with these other sources because they could radically change the way you understand that evidence, look at it, and most importantly, the way you use it to make decisions. So picking out bits of evidence from whatever source and saying they're the best, they're the greatest, they're the most important it is to me always problematic. And I think to some extent that has happened in medicine. And as you said, I think it's now maturing. It's going to another phase. Hopefully, in evidence-based management, we can jump a few steps and say, look, let's not force people. Let's not force this evidence, scientific evidence. Say It's about a much bigger picture. Than that. You know, I've learned so much from this. You know, one of the books, I started this Truth Wars book 18 months ago or 14 months ago. And one of the books, you know, I had a long list of titles and topics. And one of them was The Evidence Revolution, which is going to be a look at this from evidence-based management, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based policy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I chose to write the Truth Wars book. I don't know, maybe it wasn't a good idea or something like that. But I've learned a lot from it, even as someone who maybe, let's say, aspires to be an expert in this stuff. Certainly interested in it. Certainly, I've learned like <laughs> an immense amount talking to you. And it seems to me that you have the right kind of, I mean, I had a whole chapter of questions I was going to ask you about scientism and positivism mm -hmm. and all those kind of critiques. And it seems to me that, you know, none of those could be accurately leveled at you for your approach to things. And a lot of the critiques and some of the papers I've, the critiques I've read on evidence-based management, they seem to be wide of the mark from the way that you discuss it. So I'm, I, I think I'm hopeful. Me, me, yeah, me and the Center for Evidence-Based Management, I mean, we always say, don't be the evidence, please. This is not about perfection. It's not about making a perfectly informed decision. And in a way, it's horribly, people sometimes say when we've done a session, they go, God, this is just really obvious, isn't it? And we go, yeah. It is so obvious <laughs> that we find it really hard to do. Yeah, uh, and and in the in essence, it's just about making a better informed decision. That's it. Well, this that's all. This it has is. been great. Do you know this guy Scott Lilienfeld? By the way, next week, uh, do you know him from Emory University? The, I do know what. Yes. Yeah, yes. I got him next week. I, in fact, I think I have him tomorrow. I, I'm going to interview him tomorrow, but I'll probably go out a few weeks after you because I think he's an interesting guy. So, listen, what I want to know is. What are the best resources that you can rec direct people towards? The curious fact, what's the best book for, you know, a workaday HR manager or a workaday manager okay. on this? Yeah. So I would say right now there isn't a book, though the Center of Evidence-Based Management is working on one. So Eric Berens, who's the director, Denise Rousseau, who's involved in it, and me and others – that book is probably going to be coming out in about six months on evidence. Holy cow! Well, that's marvelous. That's uh, much needed. Yeah. And uh, Je Je Jeffrey Pfeffer's book, maybe the best so far. Uh, the dangerous. Well, the dangerous well, interestingly, I would say Jeffrey Pfeffer's book I know very well, and I think it's very interesting. Actually, sort of slightly misses the mark 
in terms of what we would mean by evidence-based management. But he wrote it 10 years ago, so give the, give the, give yeah, the, exactly. give the guy a break. The it's not, there. not bad. There's some so, stuff in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the other thing I think it perhaps overemphasizes being too critical. Yes. Of, of, you know, look at this management practice. Ha, ha, ha. Is I was ridiculous? very I was uh, very informed by his paradigm when I wrote my own stuff. Yeah, he's very much, yeah. Sure. No, and I agree that that is the case, but that doesn't necessarily help people do things better, which is what the point, I guess, the point of the book is. Yeah. So the book is coming out, but I would, I would direct everybody to the Center for Evidence-Based Management, which is www.sebma.org. That's C-E-B-M-A, sebma.org. And there are... There's papers, there's articles, there's videos, there's training materials, there's slide decks. There's a huge amount of resources on there for anyone who wants to say, I just want to read more about this now. And in particular, there's a, there's a booklet called Principles of Evidence-Based Management. It's quite easy to find. It's on the front page. So there's tons of stuff there. I would recommend people take a look. Okay. And your book is going to be called? Well, that's an interesting question. We're not, <laughs> we have, <laughs> we're not too sure that. yet. We're not too sure yeah, yet. Yeah, all right. Well, interestingly, when... We've been told by various people that the term evidence-based management just sounds awful and boring. So we might have decision-making in there or some other term or making better decisions, colon evidence. We, we, We're not we should, sure yet. We should, but talk, it, we should we, talk about we, that, actually. I might. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the evidence revolution, if it were broader than evidence-based management, the evidence revolution, you can steal that from me because God knows I haven't started the book yet, but you know, something like how management decisions, how to improve management decisions by using your expertise, or something between the craft and science too, because I think there's yeah, yeah, so yeah. something like the word of management craft and management science. Anyway, you know, we might actually have a brainstorming around that. I don't know if it will help you, might not, might not. But anyway, I'm, I'm immensely grateful. You know, you've been a great mentor to me over the last 25 years since I was a wet behind the ears graduate student in 19, do you believe it was 1997 you and I met, mate? Yeah, I was thinking about that today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting old, that's what that yeah. means. But uh, anyway, yeah, I'm super grateful to this. I'll put links to everything that you've talked about, uh, all the, all you the ways much. you pointed in the show notes. I'll send it to you so you can send it out. And then we can put it on LinkedIn and have people, um, you know, throw, rock, throw rocks at it for a few weeks. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this stuff because I'm uh, always happy to talk to you and certainly always happy to talk about this stuff. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. All right, cheers. Hey, this is kind of my favorite part of the show. Well, they're all my favorite parts of the show. I, I've seen twice now an amazing movie. I hadn't seen Three Billboards when it won the Oscar. And I don't think I've laughed so hard and cried so much it hurt. It's easily in my top 10 films of all time. So if you haven't seen it, check that out. If you like Netflix, I'm watching Jessica Jones. And if you like rap, I've stumbled across an amazing guy called Logic, probably one of the great musical voices of our time. One great book I'm reading is called Red Mars, my top sci-fi book of all time. And I'm reading Fire and Fury, which is a fascinating, though it's somewhat salacious, tale of Bannon and Trump during the campaign and early days of his presidency. He writes superbly, and while you might question his method, there's lots of he said, she said, and it is a gripping read. On the more intellectual front, I'm still reading Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker in preparation for my interview with him. And I'm reading a very engaging New York Times bestseller called Thank You for Arguing, a look at rhetoric from Socrates to Homer Simpson. And on the way out again, I know, I know, it's boring. I will quickly mention the three ways you can support this. Liking and sharing the podcast, attending my Patreon site and contributing from a buck to 25 bucks an episode and reviewing the podcast on iTunes. So I thank you immensely for your support and I thank you immensely for listening. And that's all for this week. Thank you. To celebrate the launch of the show and thank you all for listening, I'm going to be giving away books, lots and lots of books. All you have to do is leave a review in iTunes. We're going to raffle off a book every single week for 12 weeks. So head on over to paulgivens.net slash iTunes to get easy to follow directions and let me know the title of your review to make sure that you're entered to win. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think Bigger, Think Better. Great ideas are great, but this isn't gospel. Share your critical thinking in the comments. Where do I disagree? What insights were most powerful? If you got value, don't forget to share the value by sharing the podcast. Finally, to get information on book and blog releases and new video content, head over to paulgibbons.net and join the community of thinkers talking about using science and philosophy 
to make our world a better place.